All right, All right, so I'm Ryan Holiday, and I am the author of a new book called Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator, and I'm here with uh, Drew Curtis, uh, founder of FARC.com and author of It's Not News, It's FARC, How the Mass Media Tries to Pass Off Crap as News. And we are going to talk about the current state of media, the future of media, uh, why you shouldn't believe what you read, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, Drew, you want to tell us a little bit about you and what you do? Sure, yeah. Um, basically, FARC is a comedy news aggregator that's been around for about 13 years now. And it's really funny because um, occasionally somebody will submit to Reddit and go, oh, my God, check out this site. And everybody on Reddit will go, what are you talking about? We've known about it for years. And it's like uh, what, what they don't realize is, is that every year there's a new crop of 22-year-old college students entering the workplace with really nothing to do all day long that haven't heard of the website before. So every year a lot of new people discover it and then get shouted down by the people that already knew about it. Yeah, and I think we both work in the same the same business, which is, like, we exploit the shittiness of how the media currently works. Like, you do a good job aggregating um, the stories that the mass media sort of unintentionally creates comedically, and, and my job is to sort of help them produce those things. I work for authors and brands, and uh, my job is to make the news that benefits my clients. And I think a lot of people don't know that that even exists. So why don't we start and just come out and say it. So the news business is abysmal these days. Uh, should anyone believe what they read? Like what what is going on with the news cycle and, and, and how is it working? Yeah, basically the, the main problem they've got right now is there's this incredible push-pull between uh, the financial considerations of the media industry. Everybody's kind of in a financial tailspin. And so they're kind of freaking out and taking a look at, you know, what can we, what can we do that will work? What's, what's absolutely going to be the thing that'll work. And the problem you've got then is that uh, I, I use an analogy. It's kind of like, what if you're a fruit stand owner and you start hitting problems financially and you take inventory to try to figure out what am I selling the most of? And it turns out it's Doritos. Uh, that's pretty much right. where mainstream media is right now. And, and I think what's really interesting is that the people in the mainstream media and then the, the people who are sort of running blogs or, or big sites like yours and, and Reddit, they have a pretty poor understanding of the economics of their own business. They sort of are just stumbling around trying things that work or trying to see if things work. Most of them don't. And they, they sort of fall ass backwards into making a little bit of money, but not maybe all the money that they could. And... How how can it be that these people don't understand what they're doing? Like, aren't they the professionals? Yeah, the, the problem is because uh, most of the people writing and creating the content for mainstream media are journalists and came out of journalism school, and then they're having to deal with guidelines being handed down by business people who actually run the thing, and it turns out that they're not at, you know, exact cross-purposes, but oftentimes the two goals don't match up. So, for example, like, good reporting on an important story – uh, is one thing, but it may not drive traffic anywhere near as much as a slideshow of the last 20 times Lindsay Lohan got out of a car in the wonder we're on. Right. No, that's my favorite thing is like, you know, so, some guy on blogs, uh, some guy who runs a, like a blog, like let's say Nick Denton at Gawker, he says like, you know what, the best way to pay our writers is going to be we're going to pay them based on how many page views their stories mm -hmm. get. And what seems like a fairly innocent business decision, like that's just how he's going to compensate his writers ripples through the entire media system so like not only does that incentivize his writers to write a very different type of story but then because other writers are watching and copying what gawker is mm -hmm. doing the types of stories that gawker is producing determine what gets run on cnn that exact same night and it's pretty crazy yeah because regardless of whether or not anybody else in mainstream media has a similar compensation scheme the upshot is it still works if you're the guy in the office over at cnn who gets the most traffic on an article during a day and you can do it two more times during the week you're the man and so that's essentially why the things have been going the way they were it was always it was always kind of like this. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that FARC sort of got out of the gate back in 1999 was is that a lot of people forget that this really sort of this offbeat, not quite news stuff was still, it was still around, but there wasn't like any clearinghouse where it all was at. And they always knew that it sort of drew subscriptions and traffic and, and whatnot. But what they didn't realize was is that how much of it it actually did drive until we had really good relevant web statistics. And then we found out, oh, holy crap. Uh, this is actually a big deal. So do you feel like people write crappy news 
just to be on FARC? Uh, I wouldn't say just to be on FARC, actually, because it turns out that, like, uh, we're a little more clever as to what we actually pick. So, like, if you want to see what it really looks like dumbed down, though, go to BuzzFeed. Uh, and a lot of like, right. what's on Huffington Post, for example, uh, is also the same way. But I'm not, I'm not going to say that all of Huffington Post is because uh, people actually ask me about them all the time and say, do you think they're ruining news? And I say, you know, what they've actually done is they've, they've incorporated the supermarket model of basically putting all the stuff you need on the outside of the store and all the crap in the middle to try to drive people into their stores, and it's working. <coughs> so it's hard to say that's ruining think news. They... Maybe it's saving it. Yeah, I think I think what they call that is the mullet strategy, which is like the good stuff up front and then a lot of crap in the back. Yeah. By the way, uh, on and, the uh, video, you're going to see my cat walking around behind me. I uh, don't mind that. She's, all right. She thinks she right. needs to be um, fed. No, bad kitty. Anyway. Well, what's what? What I think is really interesting is the whole idea of writing news based on like sort of what will get traffic mm -hmm. and what will get attention. And that's obviously a, a somewhat new thing. Like, so you subscribe to the New York times, the, the writer for the, that the writer of the article that you're reading in the New York times, he doesn't, he isn't trying to get more readers for his article. Like no one was trying to write columns that would be like cut out and then passed no. around because they don't profit from that, that mm -hmm. happening. But now like writers for the Huffington post, they, they're not trying to, have their article read by the readers of the Huffington Post because th those readers might not actually exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they're going to get them anyway. They, they're, I mean, looking... they're more interested in trying to get the right. quick hits from outside the site, which is actually sort of the genius thing they figured out. Right, is that they're out there chasing this sort of other reader rather than chasing the, the core reader and that, it turns out, has massive impact on the kinds of stories they write because they write things that will spread on their mm -hmm. own. And do, so do you, do you, do you think that's bad for the news? Do like, what sort of, cause in my, in my book, what I talk about is that that basically makes, um, the reporter sort of enslaved to either like low quality. It makes them enslaved to sources, to brands. Like they come to me and ask me what they can write about my clients because they know that like, for instance, if they write about an author that I represent and that author has 200,000 Twitter mm -hmm. followers, if he links to their article, that's good for 10,000 page views. So they're not going to write an article that that's negative about that client because they 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 want to come to me so we can collaborate to make them money. Right, exactly. Um, and I'll tell you what, the reason why it happens because essentially the way that ads are sold completely changed. Uh, in the print media world, it's done essentially like in bulk. If you bought Newsweek, you consumed every ad in it as far as they were concerned. But now Newsweek.com right. doesn't run like that. It only drives based off of the actual articles that are read. And when it starts mattering what articles are read, that's when you see this kind of dynamic shaping up. Um, and so you get two reactions. You get the lazy reporting, and then you get sort of the shotgunning effect using gimmicks like slideshows and whatnot. And they know a lot of these things actually, you know, these things work. Like I mentioned a bunch of them in my book, uh, you know, ways that they drive traffic. And one of them is, you know, uh, unpaid placement masquerading as an actual article, which is basically, you know, the, the news is not necessarily being paid uh, to put this stuff in, but it's showing up anyways. And there are certain shticks that they know will work, like just this week. I saw somebody had uh, put out another $5,000 hamburger out in the middle of nowhere, and it, it rained again. Interestingly, in that case, right. it turns out it's just the same damn guy in New York doing it over and over again. I'm not sure how he's managing to get nice placement like that. Maybe somebody could go ask him. I'm sure there's, a, there's something going on. Well, that, that conflict of interest that you're talking about is really interesting because so I, I'm an online media buyer, too, for some of the clients that I represent. So I spend, you know, like millions of dollars a year in online advertising. And, it, it like, you know, you buy with the New York Times – like you, you call your sales rep, you have no interaction with anyone on the editorial side. Like there's a very clear separation of church and right. state. If you're buying on television or you're buying sort of these old media institutions, but like online, either, either the publisher, writer and ad salesman and founder are all the same person or the, they have no problem sort of passing along your press releases to reporters, passing along your contact info. And I, I've always advised my clients, like the best way you can get positive press on a blog is just to start buying ads there. So do you, do you, how do you manage that with FARC? Because you're, you're sort of a news information provider, but at the same time, you make money selling your audience to advertisers. Yeah, I take a different tack on it. I mean, while technically we can put up anything we want, if we do sell a link out to somewhere, we label it because that way people know whether or not it's been sold or not. 
Uh, you know, we don't tend to sell a lot of them because there's not really any, any sort of clear idea on how to actually value the things, but they are all labored when they are there. I get pitched all the time on ideas, but the way I do it is basically, is it actually funny or not? And I got to tell you, like 99% of the time, it ain't worth crap. Uh, I'm taking sort of a long-term view on it, which is basically if we started running nothing but crap, I mean, basically, you know, you can buy links on other sites, no problem, but you can't do it on FARC without us labeling it. And the main reason is because it just ruins the overall quality of the content. Uh, what people also do like is that when we link to something and label it, we'll also give them a damn good reason to go. And then at that point, they can decide on their own whether or not they want to go check it out. But uh, deceiving the reader is a terrible live business idea. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, here here's the funny thing about like sites like the Huffington Post and and some of those sort of like page view farms is that they they sort of they create all this content because they say like the, you know they're monetizing them they need to make all these pages to make money but then at the end of the day their inventory is essentially worthless because they've so flooded the market with it like MySpace was a great example like they're never going to ever be able to sell the the billions of page views that they're doing every year. And so what is it about online content and, and the advertising model that, that in turn determines our news that makes these people focus on quantity over quality? Yeah, well, it's basically it's the page view driven thing, basically. And uh, because you can write, for example, like Google's been doing a lot of trying to change the way that their algorithm works. So if you can't write an article, it's like top 10 best sandwiches or even worse. You know, write an article that's like, hey, today the New York Times ran an article on the top 10 best sandwiches and right. just copy it. Google's been trying to change their algorithm so that doesn't show up in the in the mix. But the reason they do it is because, again, like you said, you know, any traffic from anywhere makes a difference. But what's interesting is is that uh, there's there's sort of a there's a there's a misunderstanding in the news media business on digital ad sales, which is that digital ad sales are worthless, that they're not that good, that print ads sell a whole lot more. And it's like, well, they do, but that's right now currently. Uh, and what they need to do is basically make sure that they, they, they spike up the narrative on the digital ad side of things and then basically spike up the value, basically say that, you know, hey, guess what, content run against journalistic, you know, articles is worth more than top ten sandwiches because you've got more engaged readers coming and checking it out as opposed to people just bouncing through looking up at love, turkey, ham, or, you know, pepper jack cheese. Right, because at the end of the day, it's like the equation is, Page views times CPM, which is the rate you charge for the ad, equals total right. revenue. I, 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 it's always stunned me that like it, it seems so obvious that you would just try to increase the amount that you charge rather than solely focusing on increasing the amount of page views that you right. do. Well, here's the, here's the reason why they don't do that. It's because uh, they've lumped in the digital and the print sales into the same sales pitch. And the problem is, is that salespeople are pretty easy to predict. They will sell the inventory that's worth the most money, period. And then they'll just throw everything right. else in for free. So what they're currently doing is the New York Times has salespeople who go and they try to sell print ads and then they throw digital in for free. And what this does is this basically values in the mind of the buyer digital ads at zero. And until that changes, uh, they're kind of stuck with it. Now, that being said, uh, there is some indication that I've been seeing that that is changing. Um, mostly because there are now a few all-digital outlets out there pushing around. you got the Huffington Post. you got Gawkers doing their own thing. And when you've got only digital and you've got people arguing that journalistic content is better advertising space, which it is without a doubt, especially compared to social media, and the media buyers are starting to realize this. So as this narrative unfolds, as it grows, uh, I actually see nothing but upside for mainstream media, believe it or not. Uh, I am one of the few people out there saying that, but my prediction is between, I'd say probably within five years, you're going to see the old players back on top but not necessarily the same old players. You're only going to see some of them. Some of them are going to die. Some of them are going to work it out. Uh, and if you want my predictions, I look at, I see Viacom and I see Fox News as having the best strategy for the five years going forward. I see CNN in the middle. And honestly, I see the New York Times right dead at the bottom. They are not figured it out. Well, and I, I think the reason is it, it's a lot easier for, like, for instance, like you take Forbes and the Huffington Post. Like a lot of people don't understand that Forbes.com runs on a Huffington Post model of uh, anyone can contribute to this mag to this to this website. You're not your your posts aren't edited before they go live, and they're sort of playing a, a long tail. Like let, let's just get a bunch of stuff online, and in the aggregate, it'll do a lot of pages, and we'll make a lot of money. And I don't think people understand that um, they they don't see like even though they're the same. There's a, a much higher perceived value of Forbes. So if the Huffington Post is charging a dollar per thousand uh, impressions, Forbes is charging 
you know, five or 10. And that's because compared to what Forbes charges uh, to be in its magazine, that's actually a steal. So I think what's interesting is that it's going to be a lot easier for these old media brands to discount their rates than it will be for the Huffington Post to steadily increase their rates to get up to the level of what these magazines are once charging. But, but what I don't think people understand is that the, this ad model, which might seem like just sort of insidery business talk, essentially determines what you will yes. read. Like, that's the reason why everything from Slate to the New York Times uh, paginates their articles. So instead of reading it as one page, you read it as mm-hmm. two or three. And that's, that's the reason that the Drudge Report auto-refreshes every, you know, 20 minutes or yeah. whatever. And, like... So not so basically the way that these companies shake down their advertisers determines the news that you read and that's crazy mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, actually the drudge refreshes every 2 to 3 minutes and when we tried that on Fark a few years ago we almost crashed ourselves with the traffic. Yeah, I mean how is that not how is that not stealing? I mean it seems like you're basically saying you're basically saying like look you would have genuinely gotten one page mm-hmm. view but if we put this small code into our website we're going to be able to charge the advertiser th- for three page yeah. views. That's like the, the definition of, of, of Yeah, well, if you look at the ads that run on the site, you can see that the media buyers already know this. I mean, check it out. You'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You won't see any seriously high-quality ads. You'll see maybe one the first couple times you go there. And then, uh, you know, who, right. who knows after that, you'll be selling you gold and, uh, you know, condos in Florida right after that. And then uh, Nigerian Prince is contacting you about blackmail and stuff. Right, so the only people that can afford or or that whose margins work for this type of low quality advertising are people who are selling scammy, scummy mm-hmm. products that have that you know are themselves are themselves uh, you know sort of ex- exploitation. And so uh, what I what I basically say in the book is it's like everyone's too busy lining their own top their own pockets to do the right yeah. thing or to make quality journalism in some way. Like there's no Okay, he. These are the writers. We're going to put them in a room, and we're going to protect them from all this bullshit. And they can do their job while we go out and make as much money as we can. No, it's like everyone's in on it, from the editors to the publicists to the writers to the publishers. Yeah, it's because right now they're scrambling. Like I said, you know, they're working at a serious loss. I mean, the New York Times just mortgaged its building in downtown New York to make interest payment on the debt that it owns. I mean, imagine if you like you had a friend that did that with their house. What would you tell them? You'd be like, "Holy crap, what are you doing?" Right. And then, but but then, what's also interesting to me is like you know this year the, the New York Times will make what two billion dollars in yeah, revenue, exactly. and we sort of we like to throw around like you know old media dead man walking. Well, the Huffington Post they made thirty million dollars last year, and the entire company is only worth three like three hundred million, and they and AOL may have overpaid. So I think I think you're right. I, I do think we will see a resurgence in the old media. Yeah. If they can get their act together and not fall prey to copying the broken business model of a lot of these online Right, sites. exactly. Well, think about what will happen, too. I mean, this is in the next five years. But think about what will happen once, you know, they slowly start shrinking the, the costs that they have associated with the actual printing thing. I mean, printing costs are like something like, I don't know, most of the revenue, the expenses that they have. And if you eliminate that, that suddenly makes everything look really different on the other end. And you have the the legacy value of the brand, which mm-hmm. means you can charge higher advertising rates. Like like it goes back to Forbes. It's like I write an article about someone for Forbes. I like it's on Forbes.com, but then you hear people throwing around, "Hey, did you see this article? It was in mm-hmm. Forbes." And there's this big disparity between perception and reality. People think that what is on Forbes is the same as being in Forbes, but there's a big difference. Yeah, that's the power of the brand right there. And that's why I think that there's they've, they've got a shot. Uh, the other reason I think they've got a shot is you don't really see, like, in, in, a, in a marketplace that was about to get completely destroyed by innovation, you would see a ton of competitors popping up out of nowhere, and that's just not happening. There aren't any. There's no new ones. I mean, the ones that have right. popped up have generally been bought. I mean, I'm still independent, Gawker's still independent, and Drudge is still independent, and that's it. I mean, there's not really any fourth, fifth, sixth player, and there's not really a raft of people coming up behind either. Everybody's owned by a mainstream media company or a really small. Yeah, totally. All right, so so in your book, you sort of talk about the various, and, and this is the book, by the way, I'm holding it up in front of the camera. So you talk about the type of various, like, stock stories that people should look out for. You know, like, 
uh, celebrity slideshows or you talk about like every Christmas they, they run certain stories or every New Year's, like how not to get a hangover, the sort of the, the basic crap that the news turns out every year. They just rewrite what they did before. And so what do you, what should people look out for? And then when they see, they should go like, don't bother reading it. That's sort of designed to trick me or just waste my time. Yeah, one of the big ones is uh, headlines with question marks in them. Uh, anytime a headline yeah. asks a question mark, the answer is generally no. And the reason why is because if they don't ask it with a question mark, then it's not true. And that's why they use the question mark. It's a dodge to essentially prevent rival. Uh, and so you'll see that all the time. Unfortunately, some of the questions are really unfair. You know, like, has Mitt Romney ever had sex with a goat? Or why has Tucker Max never denied raping that woman back in 1990? Like, that kind of stuff, you know. I completely made that up, and right. I could actually run those as headlines because there's a question mark. It's not a statement of fact. And it's kind of annoying. So anytime you see that, usually it'll be tagged along UFOs or, or Bigfoot or some weird science thing that doesn't really pan out. Uh, and uh, you'll see Because you one. can't take back your click. Yeah. Like, if, if you click to go, is that true? You can't take it back. They still made the ad. Exactly. Question. Plus, usually down near the end of the article, on paragraph 5, 6, 7, 10, or 20, it'll have, they'll actually call the expert. They'll be like, no, what are you talking about? That's stupid. And that's the one that antagonizes me the most because that's bad journalism because most people only read the headlines. And so, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's just how it is. I mean, we all might think that's kind of funny, but at the end of the day, like, I mean, I can prove it on my site. Uh, and it turns out so can mainstream media. And so what happens is if you see a question like that, uh, people are really, really susceptible to confirmation bias. And so if you're a liberal and you say, you know, did Mitt Romney have sex with a goat, you may not read that article because you already believe it. And you're going to go and you're going to say, hey, did you see that thing in the Times yesterday? Did Mitt Romney have sex with a goat? That's crazy. He had sex with a goat. And they make that jump all the time, and that's basically it's a dodge mainstream media uses to get around, you know, basically being wrong. And it's so easy to retweet those things or post mm -hmm. them on Facebook or hit the like button. And so you're passing it along without actually – Checking to see if it's true. Right, or not. exactly. Sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes it isn't. Like the, uh, there's a guy, uh, I'm trying to think, because I met him through Craig Newmark. His name is Tim. Oh, crap. Uh, I can't remember. He's, he's uh, over at the Columbia School of Journalism and he's been working a lot. I want to say Silverman or Silverberg. I can't believe I'm blanking on this guy, but um, he's basically the king of uh, corrections. He's been watching the okay. rate of. Oh, yeah, Craig Silverman. Craig yeah, Silverman. he's been watching the rate of article corrections over the last few years and they've skyrocketed. Uh, and basically his thing was is, is that in mainstream media now, people are so concerned about being fast, they're completely unconcerned about being right, especially when sometimes being wrong drives a ton more traffic, so they'd rather just go ahead and do that. Oh, no, that's something that I, that I talk about in my book a lot. It, if you actually think about it from the publisher standpoint, like take a story that's completely untrue that shouldn't be written about. So if you follow the rules – you don't write about it, you don't get any traffic or revenue yeah, from it. Exactly. But let's say you take you take the bait and you do publish it, so that's one story, and then you have to publish your correction mm -hmm. uh, or a secondary piece saying what happened, now you have two stories. So you're actually getting two stories when you should have gotten zero stories, mm -hmm. and because the, they're not trying to build real brands that matter, uh, the whole idea of like, oh yeah, but it but it, it detracts from their credibility doesn't fly either because they don't care about credibility. Yeah, actually, I'm not so saying like one the, of the more horrifying things I've been watching lately is is that uh, I, this is probably inside baseball for people that don't, don't care about finance, but stock options pretty much expire every month on the third Friday, and I sit here and right. watch these news articles roll in because I mean, even though I'm doing funny news, I'm still reading damn near everything that comes out in a particular day. And right around Wednesday and Thursday, the craziest untrue rumors will start floating into the financial news. Interesting. And they all get retracted on Monday. It's, it's almost hysterical if it wasn't costing people millions of dollars. Yeah, wow. No, and, and like uh, I wrote about this a couple weeks ago, the, the Greenpeace hoax, mm -hmm. where uh, Greenpeace uh, paid to have Shell. They, they basically staged this big fake party that they pretended was Shell, and then they had an embarrassing gaffe happen, like uh, oil leaked all over the party, and then then they leaked the video on a bunch of blogs, and everyone picked it up. And so, you, like, you look at the Gawker story about that. The original Gawker story did, I think, thirty thousand views. The one saying that this embarrassing thing happened to uh, to Shell, and then of course Shell or uh, Greenpeace reveals that it's a hoax, that the whole thing was orchestrated. And then another Gawker site, Gizmodo, does a story that says like the how the Greenpeace hoax happened, right? Yeah. And their sort of how-to, which they fell for, did three times as many views as the 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 post reporting it as mm -hmm. true. And so it's it's like these blogs they sort of float out these weather balloons 
and you know it causes all this mayhem and then they report on it as though they weren't an integral part of propagating this falsehood or this this hoax themselves right. it's it's really a very weird mm -hmm. cycle yeah but it works it drives traffic and that's why they do it like we were saying earlier it's like we set the stage for it now you can kind of see it in action yeah um one, one of the other ones i like in your book is you talk about these the sort of a common what do you call them, common shared experiences like sort of world is round stories mm -hmm. like like the media is much more likely to write about something that uh, that everyone like to tell you what you already yeah. know because they know you'll be interested in that thing rather than something that you should know because they don't know if if anyone will yeah. care. Yeah, if you look down, um, uh, I was doing research uh, a while back for a book on nut jobs, which I, I never quite got off the ground yet because uh, unfortunately it would pretty much offend everybody somehow. Uh, because it pretty much attacked everybody's uh, core belief everybody had. Kind of like, imagine, you know, Penn and Teller's bullshit in a book form. Not the same concept, right. but that's about, I would have gotten the same reaction, which is, well, I really liked it when you're going on about how, you know, global warming deniers are full of crap, but when you started talking about how 9-11 wasn't caused by Bush, that's where you lost me. Like, that's what I would have gotten. Uh, right, because people pick and choose where they're nut jobs. They're not universally across the board. Right, exactly. And so and it turns out that uh, when I was doing research for it, I was trying to figure out, like, what are known biases that we possess as human beings? And Wikipedia has actually got a really good entry on basically an entire collection of all the biases. We've got, like, confirmation bias is the big mm -hmm. one. Uh, and actually, I should probably talk a little bit about that in a second because there's actually some really insidious stuff going online regarding confirmation bias. But that's where basically, as dumb human being monkeys that we are, we will only, we're attracted to stuff that we already know and we agree with. But then there's other ones, too. Um, there's gambler's fallacies, like uh, the, the uh, what do they call it? It's the gambler's conceit, which is basically I'm due. Which means you're on a roulette wheel right. and you've just got red nine times in a row, so you bet black because of that. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's still a 50% chance you're going to end up having red anyway. So it's like there's a number of them like that. And it turns out that uh, mainstream media outlets are well aware of these things that we fall for. And so they, they cater to them because they know it. So, for example, um, the oldest version they've known for a while is if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, we are more attracted to fear and death and gloom than we are to upside stuff. There have been any number of people who've tried to do good news blogs and they've all failed. And the reason they fail is because we don't care. Uh, so and mainstream media is not oblivious to this fact, and so they end up sort of catering to those things. So they have the entire list of potential biases that we're all susceptible to, and they basically just write these things and cater to them. Yeah, no, there's a really cool study where they looked at the um, the articles that make the most popular list of the New York Times, and, uh, and I, I talk about this in the book. The number one predictor of an article well first off the number one predictor is valence like how an article how strongly an article makes someone mm. feel one way or yeah. another is 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 integral to how much it spreads but the number one predictor of an article making the list is the degree to which it makes people angry yeah. and so like that that gets internalized by the media and they realize okay look i could write this article in the somewhat in the in the muddled complicated it, to reflect the muddled complicated nature of it of it of its actualness or I can simplify it and make it extreme and piss off one side yeah. or ideally piss off both sides so they'll both spread it. And that's the best thing that they can do. And that determines what you read. Like when the New York Times knows that the, the angriness that an article evokes from you is good for them. You think they're not going to go around deliberately pushing those buttons? Exactly. One fact, uh, people they're... that follow sports, uh, every newspaper in the country has a sports writer on staff that hates the local team. And their job is to right. write screed about the local team. And it's funny because, like, most people know their guy, but they don't realize that that's actually a business practice. They hire people specifically to be jerks. Yeah. He's like the... Yeah, he, he's the guy whose job it is is to, to sort of rally the crowd accidentally, mm -hmm. and those articles are the ones that get yep. talked about the most. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like uh, you know, I go to meetings like, you know, the Huffington Post is like annual ad meeting, and they're sitting there telling us how many comments they do each month, and they'll say like, you know, we did 100,000 comments last month, and to me that that's like – how many page views do you get each time someone comments? Probably three or four, right? Because you got to log in, you got to type, you hit preview, then you hit post. These these blogs and and now the mainstream media deliberately write articles to not be conclusive mm -hmm. and to give room for people to respond. It'd be like if if the editorial, like the letters to the editor section of your newspaper, was the most profitable yeah. section of the newspaper. Imagine how shitty the newspaper would become because they'd want to incite a lot of letters to the yeah, editor. Yeah, well, I don't think we and have to imagine it. We can blogs. just go read it. I mean, it's uh, pretty crazy. What's funny is that occasionally backfires because there's like there's a limit. There's like 
There's basically agreeing with something, not agreeing with something, being kind of outraged at it, and then there's being really outraged at it. And where they're they're trying to hit the right. kind of outrage, uh, mainly because exactly. when they hit real outrage, they run into some serious problems. Um, I live in Central Kentucky, and the local newspaper here uh, has run into some interesting problems on certain types of articles. In particular, there was one where there was a gay love murder in a mall parking lot, uh, which incidentally involved William Shatner tangentially. He was actually in the mall when that happened and got stuck and couldn't go to his car, so of course he got interviewed. But uh, you know, then there was a high-speed car chase, and you can imagine, like, basically, think about all of the all of the the hot key issues this thing hits. We got gays, we got gay marriage, right. we got guns, we got crime, crime we got high-speed cop chase. Oh man! So what they did was, is they realized pretty quickly this was going to turn into one giant hate fest, and so they shut the comments off on the article, spread to the entire rest of the site. I mean, it was for three days. Right. It was just they were playing whack-a-mole with these guys, trying to get them to go somewhere else. And of course, they wouldn't because guess what? Harold Leader, this is exactly the reaction you were primed your audience to give you, and you got it. So sorry about your luck. You, they, the, the goal, and I'll just lay this out, they, they want you to be just angry or um, energized by the article enough to comment yes. and to make them money, but not enough to do anything Yeah, it, a great it. example it's, it's is like, like um, what's his name, the guy, the Ugandan uh, general guy, what's his name? I already forgot him. Coney? Yeah, yeah, Coney. Like, that's a great one right there. Saving the world one Facebook like at a time. I mean, that's the level of outrage they want. Nothing more. And and from their business perspective, it's like Fox News wants, like, they want Bill O'Reilly, not Glenn yes. Beck. Yes. Because Glenn Beck is just too crazy yeah. to not make enough, to, to cause problems. But Bill O'Reilly, it's like, you don't want everyone to be outraged every day. Right. But once a week is yeah, enough. exactly. Plus, people can't maintain it. Usually, my my uh, one of my sayings is internet outrage lasts about twenty four hours, then it goes away. And if it doesn't, then something's really wrong. And so, for me, when I hear the Huffington Post brag that you know their article on the Iranian Revolution or whatever did ninety thousand comments, mm-hmm. to me, it's like that means you wrote a really shitty article because there shouldn't have been ninety thousand things for people to say. After well, what do you think was going on at the tail end of that? It was probably two guys arguing about you know Palestinians and guns, and you know probably for all I know, ham. Yeah, so so it, to me, it's like how much cognitive bandwidth was eaten up by these people who were baited into doing it, and then they just spin their wheels and waste hours and hours of their time thinking that they're engaged and that someone is listening. You know, meanwhile, the publisher is just leaning back, counting the money that they're raking in for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so you were talking about the confirmation bias. I, I think I think that's really interesting because I, I, there's a chapter in my book uh, about how to get your stuff in the media, and it's essentially just tell them what they want to hear. Like, you don't realize that journalists are sitting around waiting for certain types of stories that they know that the audience will want. So like, I, I just sort of, I advise people like, like, look, uh, you know, if, if you want them to write about, if you, if you want the Huffington Post to write about you, find a way that the sort of the, the liberal, um, outlook of their site fits with your message and just tailor what you just translate what you're having to say on their terms. And then they're happy to write yeah. about it. What it, what would you say about the confirmation? Well, so there's additional thing at play, uh, and the Huffington Post has been really good at doing this too. And they can't be the only ones; it's just the only one I know off the top of my head that does it. They actually will write multiple different versions of the same article in order to try to grab multiple different versions of confirmation bias when they wrote it. Um, and what right. they're doing is they're working on a semantic engine where basically, when you come to the Huffington Post, you're going to get different articles. It may be already up and uh, running uh, today. Uh, I don't know. The reason I know that it exists is because Google News has been doing it for forever. Uh, in fact, if you and I type in a search in Google or, or Google News or otherwise, we're going to get different results. If we go to Facebook, we're going to see only comments by people that generally agree with us. Now, there's nothing insidious about this. Uh, the reason they're doing it is because it turns out, again, we're dumb monkeys, and we like confirmation bias. So what the guys who write these engines have done is they've realized that we're going to consider results to be more relevant if we agree with them. So the engines, as a result, are giving us only the stuff we actually agree with. Now, the problem is is that eventually your Facebook feed gets filled up with people that only represent the same politics you do. And thus, right. I think that, in particular, this presidential election is actually being affected by that. There's a lot of outrage on both sides right now, and it seems kind of weird because people are blaming the media for stirring the pot and all that. I don't actually think that's it. I think it's a, it's a, there's a Facebook effect going on where, essentially, we get online and we see that all of our friends feel exactly the same way about gay marriage that we do. And we are outraged because who the hell are these other people that don't agree with us? That doesn't make any sense at all. But it's funny because if you ask anybody on any side of any argument who is that impassioned about it, what they see when they go to Facebook, that's what they see. They're like, everybody agrees with me. Why? Who are these other people that keep voting this stuff down? 
Like, for example, when uh, they had a gay marriage vote in North Carolina, it didn't pass. I saw a bunch of my friends in California going, oh, my God, I can't believe it didn't pass. Well, it didn't pass in California either, dumbasses. And it, it should not right. have been a surprise at all. Uh, what's even more interesting is, is it basically, uh, and this is sort of an aside, but if you look at a county by county map, at not only that particular vote, but like the last presidential election, they, they talk about red state, blue state. It's actually urban and rural. If you look county by uh, county, you can actually see, and it's really obvious in the North Carolina gay rights vote, all of the counties that light up blue have a university in them. And that's not an accident. That's pretty much where everybody who is likely to vote in favor of gay marriage lives. But the upshot is, is that the level of outrage of people who were surprised that, I mean, how could you have been surprised that North Carolina wasn't going to pass that? I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying, how did you not know that was going to be not going to be the outcome? And the reason is, is because right. everybody who has friends in North Carolina is seeing that they have friends that basically have, have their same viewpoint and it's not an accident. Yeah, no, and, and I think um, I, I, for, I think it's Lazarfeld. There's this, like, landmark study from, like, the 60s, and they call it the narcotizing dysfunction, right, which is essentially everyone, like, you read so much information, you consume so much information, and you're getting all this confirmation that you feel like you're involved mm -hmm. and you're contributing. Yeah. So the people who supported the, the thing in North Carolina, because they felt like everyone else agreed with them, they didn't feel like they had to get off their ass and go do anything mm -hmm. about it. They thought it was in the bag. Uh, because, like, yeah, everyone thinks it's in the bag. And on the other side, they all think it's in the bag, and they can't understand the monsters who are trying to ram gay marriage down their throats yeah. either. There's actually a, a good book about this um, called The Filter Bubble. I don't know if you read it, but it's, it's by Eli Pariser. Yeah. But what's really interesting, right, it's, it's sort of about how uh, all this personalization essentially gives you a very warped view mm -hmm. of the world, pol particularly politically. But the guy who wrote it is the founder of MoveOn.org. So it's like I'm reading this book, and it's like, are you going to apologize at all? <laughs> like, are you going to accept responsibility? Like, if anyone contributed to this more than uh, – who contributed more than, than MoveOn.org with their – like, n not only in terms of, like, telling people what they want to hear, but the idea that, you know, signing an electronic petition, so now that you think 500,000 people agree with you, that that matters to anyone, that that, 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 that this sort of, that I think the big myth about the internet is that the online horde of, like, nerds influences culture in any real way, and that, like, politicians are scared of them. Like, like FARC was really interesting. You guys, you might want to talk about this. FARC didn't object to SOPA. Like, you objected to it, I'm sure, in theory, but you didn't take the stand. Well, we sort of did. We actually we flipped the opposite direction and basically said that we were in favor of it because uh, we were glad that Congress was going to run us out of business. And, uh, you know, because I've been doing this for 13 years, and I kind of need a break. Um, right. So the problem we had with it was is we were kind of stuck because Reddit and everybody else was going to block out the site for the day. But I, I, this is just my personal opinion. I disagreed with it because I felt like there was no upside. Right. Basically, you're asking people to go – and call their senator and say, hey, this stuff thing's thing's a bad idea. And then they do that at 8, 8 in the morning, they go to Reddit, it's black. There's a big sign that says, go contact your senator. You call them, you say, hey, guess what, I'm not in favor of this. And they go, okay, great, we wrote that down. Now it's 8.15 and you still lost Reddit for the entire rest of the day. And it's like, well, that, that's not really cool. Right. So we tried to take a different stance on it and go, look, here's the deal. Be aware this is happening. Be aware this is what's going on. Call your senator if you want to. In the meantime, here's the site, get on it. Because we don't want to deny that to people who either don't have an opinion or, you know, just don't feel involved. But at the same time, it's like uh, that was we were sort of tangentially involved in that because, I mean, that that could have potentially done a lot of damage. Like, I don't like uh, what was not correct about the SOPA thing was is that it was an, it was an, a, a direct attempt to try to wipe out independent publishing. But what is correct, though, is that when asked about the fact that the law was so wide open, they could have exploited it to that. Their response was. Well, we wouldn't do that. And honestly, that's not good enough for me. I'd rather have confirmation uh, in the law, not with we'll just trust the big guys not to do the wrong thing because they always seem to do the wrong thing. Right. And and my problem, I think, w with the whole thing, though, is just the enormous amount of, of, of back padding that goes on immediately after. Yeah. It's like this is the thing that everyone on the Internet decides that, like, this is the hill you want to die on. It's like. God, don't take away Reddit and Fark because the world will, will end. But all this other shit where people are dying. Yeah, I know, or, yeah. You know, yeah. like, like Afghanistan that, war, that like, yeah, we're okay. You, you know, we're Sandusky. You know, it's like, I, I don't think anybody who's gone to Penn State's changed their mind about that yet. Right. And, and, and why would you when all your friends are out there congratulating you and themselves for how caring and, 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 and involved mm -hmm. they are? Yeah.
And so I, I think I think what the filter bubble does, and it, you hit you hit on this, is it really makes empathy very difficult because you have no connection and no access and no understanding of, of these other viewpoints. And on the internet, it's also really easy to be kind of cruel and very certain. Like uh, you know, on the internet in a debate, it's easy to be the most confident guy in the world. But you know, you and I are sitting in a room, and you start really grilling me. I'm gonna like. It's, it's much harder for me to stick to my guns and really articulate why I think right. about something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's, I think, uh, it, it's, it's hard to have real debates and real discussions when everyone is sort of out there in their own intellectual ghetto. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's the problem. And because, like I said, all the platforms are making it even more difficult to find counter opinions about anything. And it, it's not insidious. It's actually, I mean, this works on everybody. That's why they do it. It's just, it would be nice if there was a way to get around it. Like, in fact... In reaction to that, I'm starting to try to position FARC as the only place you can find stuff outside of your filter bubble because we're not creating one. We're literally tossing up stuff from all angles. Right, and, and that's what happens when you're a brand who stands for something. So I, I think there's a couple more questions, but I guess, like, total, and then we can probably wrap this sure. up. But I, I asked you this a long time ago. We were, we were hanging out or something, and I, and I said, who do you think is doing the news well? Because we've talked about all the bad incentives all the fucked up websites, all the things that are evil or or insidiously distorting the news. Who is and and if someone asked me this question, I would say Fark. But who who is doing the news well, and who can we learn from, and who should people be reading and, and watching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, the place that I get most of my actual honest guy real news from is from Stratfor, uh, which okay. uh, they're famous because they got hacked last year by uh, Anonymous for some reason. I think the problem is they wrote up a really interesting article about why Anonymous looks like a terrorist organization. I think they took umbrage with that uh, and ended up hacking right. as a result. But So what's interesting about uh, Stratfor basically is a geopolitical think tank that provides intelligence. And you can either buy it or you can just read what they put up online as a byproduct. I just like reading because they sort of, they're, they're more interested in getting stuff right because they're selling intelligence than they are pushing a particular viewpoint or getting access or whatever. Uh, what I think is interesting is if you take what's in common between Stratfor and FARC, it's this. We're not about the news. If that makes any sense. Like, that's not the driving force. It's something else. Like, so in our right. case, we're trying to have a good laugh, and the vehicle is the news. In Stratfor's case, they're trying to provide intelligence, and the vehicle is the news. And so when you lay something over top of it, you can take yourself less seriously uh, and not end up in a situation where you have to capitulate to anything because you can just basically say, well, this isn't really the whole point of us being here. We are accidentally the news, but in reality, we're here for some other point. And I think that that's also sort of what John Stewart's got going for himself over at The Daily Show is the same thing. Uh, you know, there's more people that watch him for the news than watch the actual news in the 18 to 34 demographic. And that's no accident. It's because they deliver it in a context that people find more palatable than actually delivering the straight up news. And, and I mean, you do you pay for Stratfor? So, like, is, is that why you think partially it's of a higher quality? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's what I'd say to people. It's like... Why are why should they deliver you a quality product that you tell them is worth mm -hmm. nothing? Yeah, actually, they, like you say, the news is worth nothing to me, and then you expect great yeah, news. Yeah, exactly, and that's why it isn't all that great. Well, Stratfor is also like because they're sort of trying to dig to the bottom of stuff. So, for example, when some kind of international incident occurs, you know, like when Syria shoots down, you know, a, a jet plane, you know, one of Turkey's jet planes, they start digging and trying to figure out. Well, okay, so today the Turkish ambassador said this. What's really going on here? And they start digging around. Right. And that's because they're selling intelligence. So they're not trying to make an interesting article out of it. And I doubt most people really give a crap. Turns out I do. And since I can't find that anywhere else, uh, I have no problem paying for it, actually, because it is actually that insightful. You get, you get a good heads up really early on it. But, again, it's an accident. It's a byproduct of intelligence they're trying to provide. They're not really doing news. They just accidentally do it. And, and look, to, to people who balk at the idea of paying for the news when you can get it, when, when you think you can get it for free, you're not actually getting it for free. Like, you're paying for shitty news with the most valuable resource on earth, which is your yeah. time. It's the only sort of non-renewable resource. So when you read iterative journalism or you read some article on TechCrunch that turns out to be wrong, you're paying for it by wasting your time. Yeah. And now you have to read two articles instead of one. Basically, whereas like the old media model was we can produce the news for X amount and we charge X plus 20% for it and that's our profit margin, what, what the news is doing now is they say the news will be free and it will essentially be free and we'll produce it for as little, as, little as we conceivably can and we'll just externalize 
all the expensive parts of producing the news onto the reader. Like, you know, blogs do this all the time. They publish a story and they go like, you know, if any of our readers want to weigh in, shoot us an email on the facts. And it's like, wait, isn't that your job? Why should readers have to be, you know, fact checking your pieces? Yeah, a friend of mine is an old radio guy. That's what happens when they don't. A friend of mine is an old radio guy. Says that's the worst part about radio. Like, anytime somebody says, "Hey, let's go to the phones and see what people think," you might as well just turn it off because you're going to get nothing valuable the rest of the way. But as far as people pay yeah, for the totally. news goes, I think that what they're really saying is people are willing to pay for good news. They just don't see anybody doing it. Uh, and I think that's the problem. Right. They are unwilling to pay for what we have in its current form. And uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it sucks. Two, you can get it anywhere. I mean, if the New York Times started charging for everything tomorrow, then I go read the Boston Globe. Okay, fine. And it'll be the same stuff. And that's what people don't want to pay for is the same stuff. They want the different stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, I actually like the New York Times paywall. I think it creates good incentives. I think it motivates people to pay. And I think it's still porous enough that it keeps people uh, – Keeps people, some people reading for free, but that's, I mean, that's another story. So I guess here's, here's maybe like a final question. So you and I are both very critical of the news business in both of our books and in our occupations, but at the same time, we still kind of profit from how broken the system was. If the system was working properly, FARC probably wouldn't exist. And if the system was in any way protected or cared about doing a good job, my job would become infinitely harder because it would be so much harder to trick and manipulate mm -hmm. people. So do you feel like we have a conflict there? Or I, I don't know, it, that, that's something that I get asked and something I think about. It's like I, part of me knows that this is all bad and it shouldn't exist, yet it's provided for me quite well being able to, you know, sort of stake out my own piece of that mm -hmm. system. Yeah, my thing is, is like I didn't notice what it was until I wrote my book. Uh, I actually hadn't paid attention. Like I was just linking to stuff I thought was funny. And the way that the book came about right. was that the genesis was that they want me to do the top stories that have ever been on FARC. Like, what's the funniest stuff? I'm like, well, it's a stupid system of categorization. Uh, I don't want to do that. Right. So I sat around and I was like, what can I do instead as far as categories go? And that's when I wrote up the categories of recycled news. The unfortunate part was is I hit the nail directly on the head uh, without having any idea that I'd done it. And when I rolled the thing out the door, I had three weeks' worth of PR set up to go on all kinds of mainstream media outlets, and then they read the book, and they're like, uh, we can't talk about this. Uh, nobody told me I was wrong. Uh, but it's just, it's, that's an uncomfortable conversation. I mean, I'm going to go on CNN for a seven-minute segment to talk about why CNN is bullshit. Uh, I don't think they're going to have me on for that, and that's the thing I ran into. So I don't really feel bad necessarily about profiting from it, but there's actually sort of a greater point, which is whose fault is it? And I'll tell you exactly whose fault right. it is. It's the reader. I mean, they wouldn't be doing any of this crap if we actually cared about the stuff that was important. Or the way I put it is, like, if, if we gave a crap about the, the Afghanistan war, CNN would spin off a 24-hour news channel devoted to nothing but. The problem is we don't care. And it's not that the media is selecting stuff. And we've basically been dis discussing this entire time, the concept of why does the media choose the way they do. They do it because this is what we buy. It's back to my fruit stand analogy, you know. If you're a fruit stand and everybody's buying Doritos, you've got a choice to make. Put out more Doritos, you know, become Fox News and turn into a you turn into a Quickie Mart. Or, I mean, you know it's not healthy for people, but it's what they're buying. And they all say they want the fruit. What do you do? And so it turns out that this is all driven by the audience. And so it turns out we have the media we deserve. And if you know, it's easy to say, and if people want it to be better, they should click on the articles they want. But we won't do that because uh, we never have. But I don't know. I, I somewhat disagree. There's that quote from Henry Ford where he says, like, look, if I listened to my customers telling me what they wanted, I would have invented a, a faster horse. Like, I think it, I think it's a it's sort of a feedback loop. You know, people click this stuff and then the media says, OK, we'll give them that stuff. And that's all they mm -hmm. give them. There's that other quote from uh, from I think it's Viktor Frankl where he's like, look, if you take man for what he is, you make him worse. And if you take man for what he could be and you make it half, and you you halfway there you know, he's better off than he was mm -hmm. otherwise. I think the me the media sort of uses, oh, this is what people click, this is what people care about as as a sort of rationalization. And what's really interesting is, like, to go to your PR discussion, this conversation that we're having, and people probably don't know this, is going on everywhere. Everyone in the news business, everyone in marketing, yeah. everyone in advertising, they all think Nailed this. It. And then they... And then as soon as someone wants to say that this is what's going on publicly, they want to make it a, a, a sort of transparent thing rather than just an open secret. They all close mm -hmm. ranks and pretend that it doesn't yeah. exist. Multiple PR firms who told me they loved the book and that they read it and I was totally right. Deliber they, they were like, it doesn't matter how much money you offer us. We mm -hmm. won't represent this book because we don't want to ruin our, our contacts with mm -hmm. journalists Same thing happened or, to me. or whatever. And yeah. yeah. And, and it's like, 
this is the, the the reason I decided to write this book. I think this is slightly different than where you were coming from at it. I was like, an accident. I think open secret. I think open secrets are total fucking bullshit. And everyone like all these bloggers, they go like, yeah, people know this is the game, and they're yeah. skeptical, and that's just not true. Like readers think that what they're reading online is basically of the same quality and made with the same journalistic standards as what they they used to get from the media, right. and that's just fundamentally not the case. Yep, no, I couldn't agree more. So it's one of those things where, you know, I, I still will say it's the, one of the reasons that the audience selection process drives the cycle so much is because of the financial shape everybody's in. If they were actually sitting on top of giant piles of cash and had a little more time to think about it and, and work out solutions, it would be a different story. But everybody's in debt up to their eyeballs, and so as a result, they're in just ultimate panic mode. So not even doing any long-range planning or trying to figure out how to – because there's no journalist in the world that likes the current state of affairs. But they don't have enough time to right. think about it or figure out a solution to it because of the money issue. Uh, my prediction, though, is, is that eventually they get this stuff sorted out in the next three to five years. And I also have a – and I'm waiting to see this happen. It uh, hasn't happened quite yet. Uh, I've seen Al Jazeera actually, of all people, make steps in this direction. But there actually is – the door is wide open for a niche player to come in and do the news right. Al Jazeera seems to be moving in that direction, but the problem they've got is – they're called Al Jazeera. They ought to change it to, like, Larry right. or something. You know, because nobody in Kansas City is going to go on Al Jazeera knowingly because it sounds like a goddamn terrorist outfit. They told it Larry TV or something. They'd probably swamp the market instantly, but I, they haven't figured that one out yet, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to give the new, like, the, the new news businesses, the startups, a pass either because, like, you know, everyone from Business Insider to the Huffington Post to, to whoever – they are starting with their own bad assumptions. And yeah. like when they, when you take $20 million in funding for your new startup, like your, your web based new startup, that makes you have to chase revenue in a certain mm -hmm. way and chase growth in a certain way. None of these, all your favorite sort of tech startups, uh, new startups are just playing the same hype game as all the other startups where growth matters more than quality. They're not trying to build long-term businesses that, that are profitable and make money and are sort of niche lifestyle businesses. Mm -hmm. No, they're all shooting, they're all shooting for the moon and, and that makes them do um, crappy unethical things, uh, unethical things to get there from not paying their writers to like basically treating it like a sweatshop to, Right, yeah, and, and then Facebook. they all do that because that's how they make the money. Yeah, and uh, and and that ultimately uh, affects everything we read. And so, what I like to people who say this doesn't matter, um, I like to quote Neil Postman. Neil Postman he talks about television as the dominant cultural medium in the '80s, sort of determining culture itself. Because when ev when everything is filtered through TV, the needs of television determine what people do, say, and think. Mm -hmm. And when the online sort of media cycle, which is now our dominant cultural medium, when it drives and determines culture, you know, the, the funny the funny jokes that we say, our celebrities, uh, the news stories that we talk about, the gossip we get, it all originates online. And that means that the needs of like sort of online information determine those cultural markers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why this that's why this stuff matters. It's not inside baseball, because at the end of the day, what starts online ends offline. Yep, completely agree. All right, well, cool. So, so thanks for doing this, Drew. This is Drew's book. Uh, it's not news; it's Spark. Um, it's really, really good. Uh, I, I actually used it pretty extensively in my book. Um, I think it's underrated. And the reason you haven't heard of it is that uh, the people in the media want to pretend that it doesn't <laughs> exist. Right. Yeah. Except for Jack yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. You can look that one up. That's a four-page review, which makes up for all of the ones I never got. It's a really, really good one. But everybody else avoided to like the plague. I mean, look, on the back, it's got blurs from Stephen King, Dave Barry, The Smoking Gun, people who are independent from the mm -hmm. media sort of machine. They were able to say that it was good, but then uh, everyone else would rather not have their dirty laundry aired in front of them. And then and then this is this is my book. It's called uh, Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator. And I sort of look at the same stuff that Drew does, but I, I, I'm sort of saying, like, look, I'm the person that he's criticizing in his book, and here's how it works yeah, from no, my perspective. Yeah, and it's really good, too. It's, a, it's, yeah. a great, I mean, it's, it's absolutely awesome how to, unfortunately, for uh, the media guys. I can't wait to see if there's anything that they have to change in reaction to it because uh, your, your, your plan works. That's the thing. All right. Well, 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 thanks, man. I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll do another one. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. All right, I'm going to hit stop now. That's good.